Hi, I'm Akiko Mizoguchi, a queer visual culture theorist based in Yokohama, Japan. I published two award-winning books, um, Theorizing BL, in Japanese, which have been translated into Chinese in Taiwan and Korean in Korea. Through this channel, I want to share my research with BL fans globally as I proceed with my Anglophone book project. Today, I'd like to talk about the origin of the larger BL genre. While uh, some other critics start the history of the larger BL genre with 1970s comics, manga, I identify Mari Mori's 1961 novella, A Lover's Forest, Koibito Tachi no Mori in Japanese, as the origin of BL. Here's my um, very worn out paperback copy, which I probably stole from my father's bookshelf many, many years ago. This paperback was published in 1970, nine years after A Lover's Forest originally appeared in Shincho, an ongoing literary magazine that was launched in 1904. A daughter of Ogai Mori, a well-known canonical literary author and prominent medical scholar, Mary must have been in a privileged position in the literary circle from the beginning of her career. A Lover's Forest portrays a highly aestheticized tragic love story of a beautiful 19-year-old working-class Japanese man nicknamed Paolo and a handsome 30-something aristocratic scholar named Guido. Guido is biracial with a Japanese mother and French father. I have both intratextual and extratextual reasons to call Lava's Forest the origin of the larger BL genre. First, the intratextual reason is that the story employs quite a few tropes of BL, the ones which continue to be the staples in contemporary BL fiction include the following five. One, both male protagonists are impossibly beautiful. Two, they assume semi-aggressive and uke passive roles that correspond with top and bottom in sex and relatively more masculine and more feminine looks. Three, both protagonists are popular with women but choose men as their ultimate love ob objects. Four, the passive uke character manifests complicated conflicts of masculinity and femininity so as to be in a feminized position in relation to the aggressive semi-character, but can still recognizably function as originally a desirable man in the eyes of heterosexual women readers. Five, the semi-character has an affluent background. Of course, semi-characters with regular economical means, such as regular high school students and salary men, that is, employees, not the CEOs of companies, do exist in contemporary BL stories, but rich characters, such as the chiefs of successful Yakuza clans and princes of oil-producing nations, are also the staples. The tropes that were inherited by beautiful boy manga within the girls' comics shoujo manga of the 1970s and 80s, and also the specialty magazine Junae, but not by the commercial BL industry since the 1990s, are the following two. One, both or one of the protagonists belong to the European upper classes. Two, a tragic ending with one of the protagonists death. Here, I must add that among the 1970s beautiful boy manga, the boy vampires Edgar and Alan in Moto Hagio's The Poe Clown, Po no Isuzoku in Japanese, are exceptions, as they are not humans. Secondly, there is an intriguing extratextual reason as well. Mari published numerous personal essays as well as novels. Let's look at one article entitled I don't want to write about sex, sexuality, say in Japanese, which was published in Yomiuri newspaper in 1964, 
three years after the publication of A Lover's Forest. I quote, I never intended to write about male-male sexuality, nanshoku, in Japanese, literally meaning male color. I never thought about it while writing a novel. One day, I saw a photograph of J.C. Bria Lee and Alan Delon as they cuddled closely together in bed. Then, in my mind, a fantastic world started to reveal itself. It made me shudder. Then, I wrote a romantic story between a wonderful man and a boy. Recently, I showed the photographs to my best friend, Yoko Hagiwara, and found out that this sense of awe was not limited to myself, nor had I gone insane. She agreed with me. She said, the way he bends at his waist feels like it, doesn't it? Yes, this waist is amazing. This is amazing, really marvelous, you're right. We went on like that. I had been dreaming since my girlhood about the graceful figures of lovers such as, say, Paolo and Francesca. They had turned into the emotion that exceeded any imagination and such feelings existed within the photograph, now wearing the scent of guilt. In the backdrop of these actors, the age of rice, ripe prosperity in France hovers like an apparition. Here, these men are audaciously expressing romantic feelings between themselves for all to see. Brearley is some, saying something with his arm out of the cool, kilt. He seems passionate. Delon's pale, violet eyes clearly conveyed the cold nature at his core. His posture is more seductive than any woman's. All of this made me ecstatic. I wrote as many as four novels based on this photograph. Jean and Alan show me the postures, poses, expressions, and all the pleasures of romance. I was in the flower garden of my dream. Those who read the novels I had written before the romance ones would surely realize that I was just an amateur who wrote as if possessed by some entity. In fact, this was not the only one, but one of the several essays in which Mary declared that she did not intend to write about male color, nanshoku, an older term for male-male sexuality. I chose this one because the way in which she depicts her motivations is especially vivid. The context makes it clear that Mary did not really think that the two French actors were in a romantic relationship. She was perfectly aware that the romantic feelings and all the pleasures of romance were her fantasies. So she is confessing that she indulged in her fantasies and as a result, she wrote the novella, A Lover's Forest. A Lover's Forest is set in 1960s Japan and the protagonists are not French actors but it should be safe to say that the postures, mannerisms, and expressions that Brioli and Dulon showed Mary within her mind are reflected on the portrayals of the characters Guido and Paolo. In other words, Mary's motivations are quite similar to the contemporary fans who take up two male straight characters from popular shonen manga, boys comics, films, and television dramas, and so on, fantasize that they are in romantic relationships and create novels and manga based on such fantasies. Such fan practices are called aniparo or second level creation in Japanese nijisousaku. While some fans create stories that are set in the same world as the original, others put the characters in a different world. What Mari did is similar to such a practice, that is, transplanting her fantasy that occurred when she saw the photograph of actors Brearley and Drulon to the Japanese setting, and let Paolo, Japanese boy, and Guido, French and Japanese biracial man, both extremely beautiful and handsome, 
play out the scenario. In addition, the excited and pleasurable way in which she talks about how her visions <clears throat> um, were instantly understood and shared by her girlfriend resonates strongly with the sense of the community of the L fans I analyze in the fifth chapter of my book, on my first book. By the way, I intend to make a video on it sometime soon. Anyways, the graceful, ideal couple Mari dreamed of as a girl is a heterosexual one with male Paolo and female Francesca. How she seamlessly shifts from a heterosexual couple to a homosexual male-male one in this essay seems to present the quintessential BL impulse. The way Mary writes, all of this made me ecstatic and I was in the flower garden of my dream, conveys the extent of her pleasure. Clearly, in the beautiful flower garden in her fantasy, she is identified with Alan DeLong and J.C. Brearley, as well as gazing at the beautiful male-male couple. One thing that differentiates A Lover's Forest from more recent VL stories is the ending where Paolo quickly recovers from Guido's death. Paolo does get panicked, shocked, and sheds tears of sadness upon finding that Guido has been murdered by the readers know his jealous older female mistress. But after probably a couple of hours, he starts to consider switching to a new patron, the black man named Raymond Numata. Probably pretty soon, when Paolo will have spent the allowance money which was given to him by Guido. Paolo has experienced the ultimate love thanks to Guido and not with his female lover, quote, it's only Guido and me who are really in love, of quote. But after Guido's death, he does not need to be a martyr to this romance. This suggests that author Mary wanted Paolo to get everything, and Paolo was her most direct agent. Here, I want to discuss an interesting analysis presented by Keith Vincent, American scholar on Japanese literature. In his 2007 essay entitled A Japanese Electra uh, and Her Queer Progeny, Vincent states, quote, it would perhaps not be too much of a stretch, stretch to argue that in A Lover's Forest, Mary has indulged herself in the fantasy of an incestuous homosexual love affair where Guido plays the role of her father and Paolo plays Mary. Off quote. It is well known that Ogai died in Japan while 19 year old Mary was in Paris with her husband and she was devastated. Perhaps then, her desire and fantasy of witnessing her father's passing and reburying him is also expressed in the lover's forest. So, of course, Paolo must survive after Guido's death, as Mary had to after her father's. Even in this interpretation, I argue that a lover's forest remains to be the origin of the larger BL genre because the female author's desire is projected on a male homosexual relationship. This is the um, bibli bibliographical information for Vincent's essay. Also, the English translation of A Lover's Forest can be found in Kazumi Nagaike's book. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. More video videos are coming up, and it would be very nice if you could uh, subscribe to this channel. Bye.